We live. We live. We live. We live. We live. Welcome to the Artist Celebration with Don Mateg and Brian Polito. What up? <laughs> so just folks, ladyfstore.com, we have a lot of stuff sold out, but we have some items still left. We have the Virgin Art Edition still left. We have the prints that are still left. And we got so much more on ladyfstore.com. So check it out. Didn't miss everything. If you missed it, maybe not first, you're last. But we still got some goodies there waiting for you. So go check That's it out. You. That's the amazing thing. This is a celebration of the work of Dawn McTagg and her contribution to Coffin Comics, which is significant. So certainly we have new additions, but also if you take a look on that landing page at the store, you go to ladydeathstore.com, upper left, you're going to see that thing. Hit it and you will see the plethora of incredible work by my friend Dawn. And, uh, Boy, Don, I wanted to say, I was thinking, um, I'm not entirely clear on when we actually met, but I'm imagining it must have been when we were like super duper convention road dogs in yes. like 2013 or 2014. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I remember seeing you guys, you know, I was doing my thing. I mean, that's completely how we made a living, you know, cons, cons, cons. And, um, Saw you guys on the scene and started seeing the work, and I was like, okay, this is an interesting group. This was the Rothick Posse at the time. I was very intrigued by everything about you guys. And as soon as I start seeing the work, I, for sure, I thought it would make my creations look 100% better with your contribution to it, your, your drawing ability, um, your design ability, your natural magnetism as a human being but also there's something about your art that's magnetic for people and I guess it was completely selfish because I was like wow it'd be great to have a phenomenal new generation contributor on the work so thank you well thank you for giving me that honor and you know i know at the time i had only been in comics for like a year so you know oh, it's wow. always a risk to you know pick up a newbie like that and, you know, give them a shot on your creation and your character. So I'm truly honored and it was so awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure is mine. I thought, you know, too, what we've always identified as sort of outlaw independent style, do it yourself. And I thought that yourself, the Rothick Posse had that same sort of ethos where it's like, we're rolling in, we're doing our thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. deal with it or don't. And I just <laughs> immediately liked that. Oh, thank you. Well, that was uh, Joe, JP. She really had that that plan, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to figure it out. I mean, when we started, we printed uh, the Rothic prints and rolled them and tied them mm. with a bow because <laughs> we had no them. idea. <laughs> and they were on super thin paper. And mm. I drew the first Rothic comic um, on printer paper because I had no idea what size oh, to wow. draw it on. And uh, like, wow. so Eric and, and J. Scott Campbell and Benitez and all of those guys, they kind of were like, okay, Don and Joe, you don't roll <laughs> your prints and tie them with a bow. <laughs> you, you don't. <laughs> We had a lot of learning to do. So anyway, thanks for your trust way back when. Oh, you're welcome. Well, you know, when you start out, I mean, I have my similar stories. When I started out, I remember this was in 1992. I had promised our first ever comic book called Evil Ernie the Resurrection. And it was a full color comic book. And it was about maybe 12 weeks before shipping where it literally dawned on me, oh my God, this book's got to be in color. Because I had done a bunch of black and white comics, but never color. So I started at zero. I mean, oh, I wow. didn't even know, you know digital <laughs> color was not quite there yet. And just, but, and I remember so many days where it was like, okay, I'm, I'm maxed. My brain's, I'm at maximum limit of understanding things. But the cool thing is, which probably speaks to you guys too, is I was just so driven to do it. The idea that I would fail or mess up or there was stuff to learn was fine. It was secondary to the drive to want to do it, you know? Yeah. But anyway, I don't know. Do you remember? I don't remember. I remember early times of meeting you guys at Emerald City. And I know your first work for Coffin was around 2014, published right. yourself and Sabine. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember the actual. It could have been 
did you ever get to MegaCon back then? Either MegaCon, no. I know Emerald City. I'm not sure. I know that I think I went to, I remember, okay, there was that one show. Do you remember in Austin, Texas? But there I actually have a picture of us with one of the uh, hotshot books. So I had already worked for you by then. Um, but that was like the first time I remember really getting a chance to talk with you and Francisca because we were all staying in that one hotel. That was a cool place. Um, yeah, that was a really cool place. And um, so I remember that show, we got to talk a bit more, but um, exactly when our first meeting was, I'm drawing a blank on too. Well, the other thing that's coming up when you recall that time in Austin was it's really neat to see where so many of us who met on the road at that time, like we're still connected. Cause I remember meeting Jamie Tyndall at, in, on the scene and uh, Paolo Pantalena, of course, Yeah. Sabine, Eric, uh, you know, I'd known Eric maybe as a professional peer, but uh, he actually was my next door neighbor at a earlier trying to remember Emerald city, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, and now it's six or seven years later, and here we are. You know, we did, we're all these road dogs, and kind of, you guys were, to me, new on the scene, and now. Oh, we were. <laughs> literally. Yeah. <laughs> it's neat. I now I guess, please. One thing, uh, another, like, convention highlight was at Planet Comic Con. We were right next to you, and this was, like, the first Planet Comic Con that I had been to. So maybe it was like 2016 or something like that. And um, our tables were right next to yours. And at the end of every day, we would like pack everything and put it away under the table. And you were like, girls, what are you doing? Just take the cloth and put it over. And I was I like, that. mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. I totally remember that. I remember I had to leave that show early and it like one minute I was set up another minute I was leaving. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it took us like half an hour to pack up or something. <laughs> that changed my con life, by the way. It's all those little pro tips, right? After a yeah. while, you kind of get it down to haiku, where it's like, yeah. okay, seven syllables. Yeah, that's one thing I mean about conventions. I love, I love having the big banners and booths, but for me, we got to get set up fast and we got to break down in GTFO fast. Yeah. I, I think we've all been on the other end of it where, for example, we'd have stuff palleted in and not really know how to pull it off. And you know, the show's over, you're done, but you have to wait four hours to bring, you know, a, a device that comes and brings the pallet out. And we're not about it. I think Jimmy could attest that even at Phoenix Fan Fusion, we have a big 20 by 10. Yeah. But, I mean, we are, I am particularly nuts about getting it broken down in an yeah. hour. Go, 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 go. Because wow. again, on, on that show in particular, if you're not broken down, uh, you're either, you're out in the first 45 minutes or you're only, you're out four and a half hours later. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but I apologize. I'm getting off the topic, which is the Dawn McDig artist celebration. Our celebration, but folks, uh, we got some breaking news here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We got breaking, breaking news. news. Shots. He's like crazy John. about customer service. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Here I am. Here I am. Obviously, crazy about customer service. In fact, all of us here at Coffin Comics, you know, we really want to make sure that everyone is taken care of. So I just want to let you know, you know, on behalf of everyone here at Coffin Comics, we want to thank everyone for their continued support during these crazy, uh, dare I say, psycho times. <laughs> it's a bad association with your name, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. but, but, you know, definitely, Brian has, I want to let everyone know that Brian has been generous enough to put his personal collection, his Brian Polito editions, Ooh. up for sale on the, as, as the main items on the sale today. So, so as of right now, if you go to ladydeathstore.com, you're going to see that we have added a number of delectable items, as Sean just said. So please feel free to go over ladydeathstore.com, right on that upper part, Don McTagg Celebration. You're going to see some fun stuff added. Great items. We've got about 11 items added. And, you know, um, 
get on it because I know that's you know some of our hollow foil editions obviously are sold out. So you know the remark sold out super duper quick. We had people buying them within seconds of of one another. So thankfully they got their. It's always a guess. Who knows, Dawn? How, how many? It's a guess. I don't know how many people want. And you know, by agreement with Dawn McTay, we agreed on a fixed number of remarks. You know, there. Dawn McTay doesn't do these uh, phone in remarks. These things are incredible pieces of art that would make an amazing addition to anyone's collection. But how could we really guess? Or even something like the Holofoil edition. Very hard to guess what should the print run be. But the demand was incredible, extraordinary for the Dawn McTay artist celebration. <laughs> Thank yes, you all so yes, much. Yes. You rock. Yeah, I definitely want to just thank, you know, real quick too, just, you know, do a shout out to some of our people that are definitely supporting Dawn and that are super duper happy to have uh, Dawn here. So we've got Melissa Gonzalez. You know, Melissa Gonzalez, she definitely picked up, you know, some of the prints. The Lady Satanas print awesome. is coming her way. And so she's definitely a good, a big old fan of these prints. We got Josh, Josh Krubner. What's up, Josh? Good to see you. He got those risk. Um, you know, he's got, also got some of your other items, some of those risque items that you have, that we have up, some of those naughty additions that we have up. You know, John Hoffman, let's see here. Yep, so John Hoffman, oh, he liked that naughty chain virgin art editions. Yep, those virgin art editions too, they're going, you know, they're going quickly. So if you don't mind the suggestion, you know, just get up, hop on the store now, <laughs> get on the store and see if you, you know, what you like and get it now. Just my own little stuff. Suggested if you see Got something you copies. like, get it, you know, and you can get them signed uh, by both Brian Prince. and Don. Prince. We don't do that that often where you can get the artist to sign your book as well. And then again, I've got the CGC information out there. If you want the CGC on the books, do me a favor, just email me at inquiries at coffincomics.com and even leave a comment. You know, if you leave a comment when you're checking out that you want this book CGC, man, that's going to make everything, uh, you know, go well. I want to make sure that you get exactly what you want, that you get, you know, you get exactly what you ordered. I mean, I know Chris Cosgrove, he's got a bunch of items getting all right, Chris. Uh, and that's going to be coming down your way. So we definitely appreciate that. Uh, Gary Compton down in Tucson. Gary, Gary in the house. Yep, Gary's in the house. Yep, Gary's in the house. Yeah, so we definitely want to make sure that we uh, have all you taken care of. So again, uh, I'm Psycho Sean. What am I crazy for? Customer service. Service. Yeah, <laughs> service. Don, thank you. Uh, right. <laughs> yep. Later, alligator. Awesome, that's great. So BP editions, Brian, that's that's wild. So these that's are the ones that cool. have, they're fun. The ones your initials on that says for BP that they know that's your that's your copy, right? Yeah. So what would happen is uh, what would happen is what we'd like to do for the artist and for myself is we'll actually print uh, the artist's initials or sometimes my initials. And I just thought it'd be kind of fun to add some of those BPs in across the board. We had seen everything else sell so fast. So give people another shot. Um, those things are fun. They're fixed. I think we do, depending on the print run, maybe on the origin art editions, uh, five for myself, five for the artist, um, even some for Sabine. And then um, on the smaller editions, let's say metal or the holofoil at 26, I think there's maybe two copies, three copies. That way we kind of keep it relatively low. You know, authentically rare. Yeah. Good times. <laughs> so these so these editions that, uh, that we're offering, what do you remember about, uh, like any stories that you remember from these uh, these covers that you, Dawn remember some of the um, instructions she's got, remember some of the, the newer ones, the design of the, uh, the outfits. But, uh, what about your perspective? Did you uh, remember anything from that? Well, what I hope to do every time I work with an artist and I give a theme, I hope that it's broad enough that the artist can step into it and make a pretty cool contribution. And I want to make it exciting and thrilling enough that it inspires folks. Like I remember a couple years ago, Dawn and I were working on a theme, which we offered to some other cool artists, and it was about fashion. And it was coming up with different costumes. I think we were all kind of, Dawn, myself, others are uh, fans of Alexander McQueen and Fashion Week. I think time. 
I like Fashion Week from the perspective of creative expression. I love to see people show up and present stuff you'd never seen before. I look at it as walking sculpture. And, you know, if you know anything, if you can see anything and when people make clothing, I mean, it's super intricate. So that that was a challenge. Sometimes early on, it might be a, some, something as simple as we're interested in a Halloween theme and maybe Lady Death as a witch. And then I feel as an art director, for me to go further, I start stepping on an artist's contribution. Because to my mind, I've hired the right person to begin with. And then if I give a couple keywords that work with what we're doing editorially, that should allow them the space to kind of take off and fly. So that's usually where I'm coming from. Uh, on occasion, like in the case of Lady Satanis, I did have my costume design that I provided to Dawn. And that was one of those rare occasions where I said, hey, can you get can you stay pretty close to the design because this is the first time people are going to see this character presented. And there was a lot more flexibility, I think in the risque version, because maybe it's a change of clothing, but this, the first one I want to really establish, because that, you know, Dawn, you remember that was the first yeah. appearance at all. And I love the before. sketch that you sent. I wish I had saved it. <laughs> like, post that too. <laughs> You know, it's funny, uh, if you ever get a chance to come to my archive, and there's a great chance you will when you're a guest at Swordfest, yes! February 26th through 28th, uh, be there, come from all over. All these shenanigans will be done with, so just come out. Um, but you'll see that I do these chicken scratch drawings. However, what I'd like to say is that beforehand, I, I'll do, do countless drawings to arrive at what I think is, what I call iconic simplicity. Like for example, let's look at Lady's original costume. Simplest costume on earth, but I tell you it took years to head towards that simplicity. So even with Lady Satanis, I did 20 or 30 or 40 drafts, but what I like to have confidence in is the thought that when it's done, it's simple enough for an artist to draw, but iconic enough to connect with like a good amount of people. That's usually my objective. And my archive is full of chicken scratch of like the first purgatory, Lady Death, all the characters. That so. is awesome. And there really is a lot to be said with less is more um, as far as the design elements and those things that make it, you know, iconic and what it is. <clears throat> yeah, I think with this character, I mean, it was, came out kind of naturally, but you could see that, I mean, first up, Lady Satanis has red hair. So I tend to like to kind of go almost with a simple palette. So if her hair is red, a lot of things should be red. And we have the trident and yeah, it was actually all right there in the drawing. It was. Yeah, it was all, you know, all those little details are in the drawing. But yeah, I think That's, that- Even you know, the her, idea, her, the trident being up was in the sketch. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting too, like what we're trying to get across, and I think over time we will, is that Lady Satanus is a character that Lady Death would look up to. And that's a tough challenge because Lady Death is looked as such like, she's such a boss. And the idea was like, who could, who would she look up to? I think in the storyline Blasphemy Anthem, we kind of began that where uh, she took some actions that Lady Death could observe and say, hey, okay, I think she's pretty rad. So that's another thing about the character, Lady Death doesn't have those types of relationships uh, where maybe a sisterly look up to somebody kind of character. She's usually, it's very adversarial or she's completely superior. So by design, it was kind of fun to create a character that would be kind of like the, yeah, the boss version of Lady Death. <laughs> Interesting, that is so cool. Yeah, it's fun. So yeah, those are some of my thoughts about the design process. I mean, I'm looking back on this one, Chained, and certainly this is the naughty version, but there is there was the quote unquote nice version, which was another completely different design. That's another thing that I would acknowledge you for, Dawn, is let's go back a step. Like frequently when we work together and we're commissioning covers, we do quote unquote naughty and nice, or mm -hmm. let's say an A cover and a B cover. And I acknowledge you in particular for taking that premise to a whole nother level. Because 
I think, I believe the Naughty Nice concept was invented by Eric Basaluda. And the premise was you would start with a nice image and then quote unquote, put a patch on and make it quote unquote naughty. And the, the degree to which those images were different was, it wasn't a lot in the beginning, but I think you as an artist took the idea to make, it's virtually two covers in a sense. So the, the nice will be one representation of the pose and then the naughty is a whole different representation. And I, I mean, they all come out I mean, I think you're the benchmark for this stuff is what I'm saying, because oh, thank you. You know, the way you take a look at it. I'd say probably, um, like you said, Ebass was the one that really came up with the concept of the patch. Um, and probably by the time I came onto the scene, Ebass had leveled up his original concept and made it more complicated. So I was just kind of following Ebass as my mentor. I was kind of following his lead in all of that and then just trying to put, you know, my spin on it and not straight up rip him off. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, for sure. I, I definitely give Eric respect. It's interesting because people can invent things in comics. They're not proprietary. You can't patent them, but I definitely big up to Eric for inventing the concept naughty and the naughty nice patch for sure. And I get it. I've invented a fair amount of stuff and it gets lost in time, but I always try to point it out that, you know, Eric, was the G on all that stuff for sure. That's amazing. Yeah, another thing I would point out too is I don't know how you feel about this, Dawn, but to simply establish an amazing pose that really connects, that's that's, that's hard. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, it's just the you know something that's iconic that really connects with people. So the idea that a naughty and nice can be derived from it, it's sort of like all that hard work. It deserves a lot of different attention. I think. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I it, hear you on that. Because it's yeah, really it's, hard. It's the pose is everything. The pose is everything. And, you know, I, I think the type of pose that connects with people most is it's kind of what I call the Cosmopolitan magazine cover, which is historically forward facing. It's almost eye level. So you begin by that limitation. Yep. And yet it's all our jobs to always make that fresh and new and find a new attack. Personally, I like that uh, limitation because it's, yeah. it's, it's the target. Yeah. I so agree. I don't, I... And having, having that limitation and also not making the face too tiny, you know, especially for the main character. If, if it's more of a pinup cover, I understand that there are, you know, the crowd covers and the scenes and the fights and all of that. But for something like this, where it is essentially a, a pinup cover, having the face where it's not too far away really helps. So that's why a lot of times, like the, the perfect ratio is to cut the, cut the body like right below the knee or like between the uh, calf and the middle of your thigh or something like that, that makes the face big enough while also being able to have some background. But I'm telling you, after I sent you the layout for this one <laughs> and realized the reality of my situation that I had locked myself <laughs> into with all those freaking chains, <laughs> I was just like, Dawn, <laughs> never again. Cause that I, I take the blame for that. You, I don't think in the art notes you specifically requested and just draw a chain curtain. Like who does that? <laughs> <laughs> we all we're the beneficiary though. That's the best. We love it. And I tried to like twist them so that they weren't just all straight on and tried to make some of them on like a perspective so that they're going further away. And halfway oh, yeah, through, yeah. I was like, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's fascinating when you think to get just to hit the simplicity. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because people on that image, Naughty Chain, you're looking at the figure. But of course, yeah, that background is so detailed. I think yeah. what was uh, also miraculous about this cover was the color palette. It's one of the yes. earlier times in what we published where you get that amazing combination of the violet and the gold. And that is such a winning combination. That is Sabine, man. Her color choices are just another dimension. Like yeah. I've known her since I was eight years old and Sabine's color choices have been spot on since we were like <laughs> eight and six years old and coloring together. I could just see it then. Like, yeah, she makes some good choices. Yeah, I thought, I mean, I give, I give all the cover artists 
of Coffin Comics a lot of credit for keeping our characters relevant and moving with t the time. And, you know, from my perspective, no joke. I mean, to me, you're looking at the state of the art. And I mean, I, I can actually can hire anyone on earth and you know, that I come back to certain artists like you, Don, it, it's, it's a choice because uh, the work is so, uh, it's such a pleasure for me to receive. I, I guess I'm the biggest fan of all because I get to see, I get to work with you and I get to see the material as it comes in. It's such a delight to this day. So for example, uh, you and I just completed a secret project. That is correct. And it was so neat to work on that. And it came down the pike very fast. And, you know, it's fun for me. I'll get the, the imagery in. I'm not going to say anything. Then I'll call Francisca in. And, you know, it's just fun. I mean, that's, I guess that's, uh, I know that this is a career and a vocation, but for me, it's always been a hobby. And it's always delightful to get the work in. So this one was, uh, particularly incredible this new one. <laughs> oh yeah I'm glad you're happy with it and it's it's always so fun when the assignment comes in you know I'm always a little bit like excited <laughs> and slash slash pins and needles like okay so what what am I gonna get assigned this time and so it's so fun and one thing I was talking about in the previous live stream that I really appreciate about working with you Brian is like you have so many hundreds of artists that you're working with all simultaneously because you have so many things in the pipeline and you've got like this sale over here and this Kickstarter and that project. But then you're also like two years ahead with your planning and like, mm -hmm. do you have like a massive spreadsheet with reminders or something? How do you keep that all straight in your head? Because I'll give you my, my schedule of where I'm going to be working and then a week before, like clockwork, we get you get in touch, and it's like, here's your assignment. This is what I was thinking. <laughs> is that Francisca? No, I actually I'm pointing to areas. I'm in my office, and I'm pointing oh, okay. to my my wall where it's really simple for me. Like my background actually was working as what's called an assistant director in commercials and music videos, so uh, and feature films uh, in the motion picture business. That's my actual training, ah. and. I would be required to actually schedule things. So how do you take a couple pages of script or storyboards and how do you break that stuff down? So my training says to break it down into time, energy slash labor. Yeah, and what the what assets you need. And there's stuff that I'll know and then there's stuff that I don't know. So if I don't know something, I get the expert to tell me what that is. I'd never pretend I know. So as an example, let's say I remember doing this thing. It was a lot of stunts. So you work with a stunt coordinator ahead of time and say, well, okay, you're going to roll over this car and blow it up. It's going on fire. Can you tell us how long is that going to take and what's it going to take and how can we support you in that? And then we'll get that estimate and kind of build it in. So uh, as a dear friend of mine who has since passed always told me, it's like, Everything that I learned in film production has contributed so mightily to Coffin Comics because, yes, what I actually use in my case is very simple. Uh, I use Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, and an old-fashioned planner. I can show you my planner. See if I can oh, get cool. a hold of it. <laughs> just a, you know, just a Franklin movie planner, and I got all my data in here. And oh, and then, you have a custom page. I have a, a ring binder like that to keep track of my work as well. <laughs> there you go. And then the company itself, we operate, uh, we use the Google business suite. So the whole company is online and we have an intranet where we can communicate everything out. Um, and Francisca oversees that element of it. So it kind of starts with a real simple, I have like three or four binders. Oh, wow. Keep that nearby. This tells me a lot. And then I'll be only working on like two or three of these to formulate plans. Big picture. So inside here will be stuff for the future. And then I, in that real simple way, I then transcribe that to the team via Google Docs. And then even more planning kind of goes down. But for me, it'll be simply a matter of putting myself, well, I, I report to my binder. You know, when it's time for business and then I see, OK, what is it that I'm supposed to do and try to be rigorous about planning 
what it is I'm supposed to do. So I guess that's it. And just don't mess around. <laughs> binders are the best. My husband's always making fun of me for my green binder, but like I live <laughs> in my binder. <laughs> yeah, you, got, you know, you, you kind of got to, it's a different conversation for a different time, but I'm into a thing sure. called out, outcome based planning. And to pull that off, you have to have a super clear vision of what that future thing looks like such that you could go backwards and actually figure out what's it going to take to mm -hmm. achieve it. So yeah, I'm all about it. Um, I think some of those skills that I mastered in film production really kind of enabled us to do what it is that we do here at Coffin. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I see a guy like Jason Coates is having some questions. Since Brian Plato is here, can I reemphasize allowing the fiends sworn to watch cover art to unfold in real time is a truly amazing opportunity really shows much more. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think Dan, Dawn will, um, by agreement, some images as they unfold are presented to folks, but then sometimes they're just not because surprising folks is a lot of fun, I think. And that's what I, I think on this last project that we were, it's a complete secret. So the only thing that people know is that there is a secret project. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, it's sometimes fun to show, and then I think it's sometimes fun not so much to withhold, but to provide surprises. Because, uh, you know, if we know everything, like, what is there to know? But isn't it more, Jason, isn't it kind of delightful sometimes just kind of um, learning that something exists that you didn't know? I like that. <laughs> Plus, it's fun to tease you guys. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I'm seeing some... Checking out some more comments. Yes, for comments. So I was wondering too. Okay, you guys touched on it at the beginning. You had some uh, road stories at cons. Do you have anything else like that? You guys, when you pass cross paths uh, at cons, any, uh, any other interesting stories that you remember? You know, I think. It, I mean, I, I don't know about Dawn. Uh, but one one thing that I could say quickly. I'm sorry for talking so much during this piece. Um, you know, so much. Dawn and I were actually were neighbors at New York Comic Con. And I think so much frequently the focus is, at least in my case, it's like, it's a cons are a marathon, right? So yeah. it's being there for everybody during that time, afterwards getting something to eat and then getting rest. Now, if you go back in my case to 1992, I remember going to cons with Stephen Hughes and our team and we're lunatics. We're up, we're partying our butts off literally till six o'clock in the morning getting one hour and we're talking shit you know the whole thing all night and then we're going to sleep for like two hours and then we're getting up now that's great maybe for the first 10 years but i'm entering the 29th year of being in comics and <laughs> i have to personally i have to pick like the late nights you know it's not it's not it's not like third it's the first night of the con is going out till four o'clock in the morning <laughs> yeah no <laughs> But that was, it's funny, John, because I thought like we, you, you guys have a mysterious quality. So I'm imagining, okay, these guys are out till four o'clock in the morning every night. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Joe and I, we love our pajamas. <laughs> so it's pretty much, I mean, yeah, in my, in our first couple years, we would go out and hang out and stuff like that after the shows. For starters, I have a lot of commissions to get done usually. And I like, I feel that I'm at a convention to see everyone, you know, to sign books, to be present. And when yeah. I have my head down and I'm drawing, my focus face can very easily be misconstrued as a very bad bitch face. <laughs> 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 so I try to look up more often. And something I learned from Ebas was to actually draw standing up. So I've, I've trained myself over a little while to learn to draw standing and still be able to kind of retain that hand to eye coordination, which everything gets thrown off when it's different, you know? Um, so for me, I try to just be as present as possible, which does slow me down on my commission list. So I pretty much get food and get back to drawing. Um, but I remember one, one convention we did hang out after the show and that was at Phoenix Comic Con one time. So we were hanging out with you and Troy and um, Francisca, and we were all just chatting for a while, and that was really fun. That was fun. Yeah, Troy was a real character on that one. That might have been the one where him and – it was the weirdest night, but that, that's what, <laughs> what happened to Khan says a Khan. It was a funny night. Right. <laughs>
Yeah, I, you know, it's funny too. I say that, but I mean, I try at most cons to like reserve one night where I'll go late. And I think Jimmy Calabrese can attest to this. Fran saying something in the background. I think Jimmy could cal could attest to this. Like, I'll I'll front like I I'll, I'll go to bed at a reasonable hour every time, but there's always like I'm usually like the last one. I I, I could definitely close it down every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brian's got the uh, you know super energy there, and he knows he knows it's a performance too that he's there for the fans. Like you, Don, say you know you're there for the fans. You want to be 100. percent You don't yeah. want to just you know. You know, there's a time. Yeah, like Brian said, he saves his one that one night, late night. He'll, uh, you know, uh, rock it out with the artists and all everybody. But yeah, he wants to be 100. percent So I think well, I, I, I did it the other way too. Like for example, I do remember. I think vaguely it was like a New York Comic Con, and I no, it was a Chicago Comic Con. So there was a big pro wrestler. I don't remember his name. We all got in a drinking contest. The guy had 150 pounds on me. There's no way. So we. It was one of those weird nights where it's like we can. Thursday night for Chicago Comic Con in the 90s, and the con was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I drank way too much because I wasn't professional. And oh. and the next day I was hungover. And and I realized that's just no way to present yourself if you're trying to be optimal for meeting folks who, you know, came all a certain way and you know they want to meet you and you want to be optimal. So it was that was the lesson. It was easy. It was like I only had to learn it once. Like I remember. Even as a kid, you know, I was kind of like one of the smart kids in school kind of thing. And one time I partied during lunch only one time. And in the afternoon, I was intoxicated and I did it once. And I'm like, I just don't like this. You know, it's like yeah. I, I believe there's a time and place for everything. Like even in college, I could party my ass off. However, I would go to my classes, I would do my homework, and then I would party. So I guess I concluded that the best thing to do is to be your optimal self. At a con. <laughs> yes. And hungover at a con is not a pleasant experience. I had it a couple times and I'm a one wine glass of a night person now. That's it. <laughs> Got to regulate. <laughs> yeah, a comment here from Scott. He remembers from uh, Tucson. He was yep. years ago. Both of you guys there. That was any great. memories from that one? Do you guys remember anything from that? I, it was just great to have Dawn as a guest at Tucson Comic Con, which is the Comic Con that we oh, co-own. Tucson, okay, yes, yeah, I remember that. So yeah, he and he was there while we were discussing the uh, Lady Satanus. That's right, <laughs> and I think he is the is it the proud owner of that piece? Y yes. That because while he was standing there with our conversation, he's like, I claim it. <laughs> he got it. The first ever Lady Satanist. It's awesome, man. I'm happy it's in Scott Noe's hands. If anyone's hands, it's great that it's in his hands. That's wonderful. I bet Sworn Fest will be huge. I think it will be. If it's anything like what Fiend Fest was, Fiend Fest was bananas. I mean, it, I, I, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I would say that for most people, it was a spiritual experience, myself included. It was it. I was on a high after Fiend Fest for about six weeks. It was just a remarkable experience. And I'd like to think that we've done some neat improvements for Sworn Fest. For example, uh, at Fiend Fest on the Saturday night, we didn't really have a place for a party. So we wound up doing a thing a little bit in the lobby and that was okay. But this time we actually moved the event to building B of the Mesa Convention Center. It gives us a lot more room. And we're going to hold the party both Friday night and Saturday night at the convention center. But on the Saturday night, we've actually rented the theater and we're actually going to do a whole PA system and thing. And we're going to do rock and roll karaoke. So everybody, everybody's going to sing a song. So Dawn, sorry. You oh, gotta pick a no. tune. Yeah. <laughs> no. I think I'm going to have to put that in the contract. <laughs> You're gonna have to, or I'm gonna run and lock myself in a bathroom somewhere. No one can find me. <laughs> we can do a we are the world. We are the world with the. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Jimmy Calabrese, if you were doing rock and roll karaoke, do you know your song at all? Do you have a song? Oh, uh, yeah, I've been thinking about that. That that that's a tough question because I want to make sure it's you know the songs I'd want to do, but then I make sure they're songs that everyone really enjoy. Uh, yeah. I do a, I do a karaoke version of um, Queen. Another one bites the dust. Wow! But uh, I don't know if I'll, I'll be pulling that one out. But uh, yeah, I definitely want to rehearse. I'm gonna get get my song down really good. So when I go up there, <laughs> <gonna walk> <laughs> that's awesome. 
Do you allow multiple people to karaoke as once? And does that count towards contractual ob obligations? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, that okay. Works. Maybe we could do that. I remember that reminds me of, as a kid, I remember being 18 years old and I remember the first time I drank Southern Comfort and uh, like 10 of us were singing Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. And this is as it came out, you know, and yeah, I just still remember it's just one of the most ex awesome experiences of our lives. There's like 10, you know, we're all like theater kids or outcast yeah. kids and, and just like singing our hearts out. So that's what's fun about karaoke. Um, and I, yeah, I just think it's silly fun. And what I like about karaoke is, you know, you get so many people like you, Dawn, who are like in the beginning, you're like, oh no, I please, I can't, ha ha ha, not me. And then as soon as you get somebody on the microphone, you can't tear it off some people, like Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, I could never. No, never. And then you get on. And then you don't want to give the mic away. <laughs> there are those people. That's right. Oh, I got Let's five minutes left. Got five All minutes. right. Let's see. What does Cornell uh, say? Sworn Fest karaoke. Damn, need to learn how to sing without making people throw up. Actually, uh, you can try. I mean, I don't think the, the importance of the karaoke thing is just uh, it, it's fun getting embarrassed together. Yeah, that's true. And there's Jason Jensen saying Dawn is my favorite lady death artist. Oh, I love you, Dawn. Jason. Thank oh, yeah. you. Shannon, I could still have jeweled until midnight each night and still would have had a line. That's right. Wow. Theme Fest was insane, yeah. Oh, God, Mad yeah. Mike. Hell yeah. Mad hey, Mike. Mike and I. <laughs> and Jason agrees. Spiritual experience, for sure. It really was. It was cool. Yeah, we'll have a good time this time. We had, and more surprises, I guess. Jimmy Calabrese, next Friday, we're going to actually announce the next two guests at Swornfest. So, so far, we've announced Brian Polito, Diego Bernard, Dawn McTague. Yeah, all the way from Brazil. Dawn I'm McTague. so excited to meet Diego. Oh, man. I'm excited. Guy's a beast, right? And then yeah. Dawn McTague and Mike McLean. Who could possibly be next? I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Love seeing people's comments. Scott, no, if you want to do um bop, you, you could do whatever you want to do. I, I'm guessing in our crowd that like Motley Crue, ACDC area is probably the sweet spot. One of my songs I love to do is, uh, and I've only karaoke once in 18 years, but what I liked to do was uh, The Man Comes Around by Johnny Cash. So the lyrical content is very, very intense in that one. I like it. Oh, we got Nick Napalm. Let's just start practicing now. Actually, you start practicing now, Yacht Rock. <laughs> you better start working on your your Phil Collins, Nick. You know it. So Nick and I had a, a inside joke uh, at the old HQ. Uh, what would be a Phil Friday? So we'd always listen to Phil Collins because for some reason I don't know. Brian, you started uh, teasing Nick about that he loved Phil Collins, which I guess that's not totally not true. So <laughs> it was. Uh, it was just a running joke that we always do Phil Friday, so we listen to uh, some Phil, to the Church of the Phil. I think, so, yeah, it, it, I think it's fair to say that among the uh, Coffin Comics crowd, let's see, we'll be sure to rock out with the Phil Collins, Phil Friday. <laughs> we, uh, I think we take music a lot more serious than, like, we're not really sports guys, but we're music guys. Like, we could probably talk about, like, who was the third bass player of ACDC a, a lot more, and... I know with a lot of my dear friends, like that's what we argue about. Like, you know, when exactly did Metallica start stinking? That kind of, those are the important conversations for us. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know what's going on in the rest of the world, but if you want to talk about horror movies, comics, or music, Hard rock we're music, your yeah. people. We're your people. <laughs> that's so awesome. Jason Coates saying, when the man comes around. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that, yeah. Yes, I did. I wish that one kept going. And I apologize, folks, if this uh, conversation with Don McTague has gone all over the map. But what I do how want we to roll. Say, that's how we roll. What I can say, though, is that Dawn, from the heart, it's always a uh, privilege to work with you. I think your contributions to Coffin Comics are vast. And I can never thank you enough for what you do for our company. We really appreciate it. And Every time I get a piece in, it's a thrill. <laughs> Thank you. It is an honor. Thank you so much. I have had the time of my life with every project. Excellent. I'm happy. Yay. 
Good times. And folks, up next, so in another hour at 3 o'clock, Don's going to do a Q&A session. I got some uh, questions lined up for her, but we also want to uh, take some more in-depth uh, questions for about her um, you know, artist journey. So, yeah, we want to make sure to stick around for that coming up in an hour or so. So it looks like we're at the we're at the end point. Uh, you guys want to say anything else to the fiends? And uh, anything else about the artist celebration with Dawn McTague? Want to say at the artist celebration with Dawn McTague at ladydeathstore.com on the upper left. We actually at the beginning of this session, we added a bunch of goodies for your consideration. Woo! And again, I, I can't thank Dawn enough for being willing to play the game and have fun with us on this celebration of her work that at this point actually it's hard to imagine that this image is six years old because it looks it looks like it could have been rendered yesterday. And I bet you Dawn's probably self-critical, but boy, this is a phenomenal image. So I can't thank you enough for everything, Dawn. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for taking part in the whole celebration, for being here, for your support of Coffin Comics and everything that they do, which makes it possible for me to draw. And, you know, I love you all a ton. Love you too. Peace out. Swarm. Talk soon. <laughs> and we ending out.